but um, it's, it's really great to see you. This is our annual Faculty of Science um, Dean's Homecoming Breakfast. But of course, uh, depending on what time zone you're in, I suppose this could either be a midnight snack or a, um, a ridiculously early breakfast or maybe even a lunch or dinner. But um, uh, whatever you're eating or drinking, I um, hope you can sit back and enjoy the next hour because I think we have something that's uh, really, really interesting for you, a, a conversation a little bit different than what we would normally be doing in Redpath Hall uh, for this event. But it's a, it's a conversation about something that's uh, truly, um, I think, becoming a, a trademark of the Faculty of Science. Uh, certainly, uh, as I'll describe in a moment, it's been a preoccupation of mine uh, uh, in my 35 years as a, uh, a faculty member here at McGill, and especially in my last six years as, as Dean of Science. So sit back, um, my two colleagues who will be doing the, the conversing, and I'm here to, to listen along with you, uh, Diane Deschef and Marcy Slapkoff. Uh, they're uh, both come out of the Office for Science Education here in the faculty. Um, you might not have heard of the, the Office for Science Education. Uh, it's a relatively new entity. Um, it's been, it was funded uh, by a visionary philanthropy from members of our, of our faculty advisory board. And what it's allowed us to do is to, uh, from a science perspective, uh, carry on the work of the teaching and learning services uh, that's central to the university. And it's leading the discussions, leading uh, students and instructors through innovations in teaching, innovations in course development processes, and the essential parts of the learning experience for students, uh, such as innovations in assessments. Assessments are no longer just midterms and final exams and, and essays. So um, what are we talking about today? Uh, the advertisement uh, reads, Communicating Science. Uh, when I asked Jennifer Abbott, our organizer, um, what the agenda was for today, um, she replied very politely, uh, I don't know, it, it was your idea, Bruce. And so it made me pause and I said, yes, uh, absolutely. It's, uh, it was my idea for this, but uh, ideas sometimes come from other, you know, other places. And I, as I said earlier, it's really as much a preoccupation as an idea. You know, I've read or evaluated maybe 200 the PhD theses here, uh, 50 master's theses, several thousand manuscript in my research work, uh, certainly several thousand grant proposals in some of the work I do for agencies. And what is so striking is that the quality of the science that's being described, either as research accomplishments or future plans, the quality is so high. Um, and that's not just at McGill, but what I see in the science community. But what so often differentiates one from another because life is about ranking and positioning something as being, you know, top of the pile versus um, not there, uh, is the quality in which the idea has been expressed, the clarity in which the idea or the results or the analyses have been expressed. And this is true both in verbal and written communications, not just solely written communications. So it's really took me a long time to realize that verbal writing and reading acumen, especially among our students, was so linked to their clarity of thought. Uh, if the clarity of thought's not there, then there, there's really no hope for expression of the thought. So I publicly declared several years ago at a meeting with deans and faculty, and I think much to their many people's annoyance, but you know, we have to stop talking about communication skills as being soft skills. Uh, to me, soft skills are, uh, they, 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 they bring up images of marshmallows and I don't know, clouds, uh, ice cream. These aren't soft skills, these are essential skills. And they're especially essential, essential today for, for scientists. So here we are, we're, we're talking about how students uh, how we can identify the need for students to learn to become effective communicators, how the Faculty of Science is enabling this uh, through programs, through, through uh, 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 workshops, through uh, processes. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. 
So let me let me first introduce my colleagues uh, very quickly. Um, we will put in the chat uh, the written version of their their mini bios. First up is Diane Deschef. Um, so Diane joined the Office of Science Education just this last summer. Uh, she's uh, uh, had been working uh, out of the McGill Writing Center for the past six years. Uh, and as, as a result of her work to support students in developing their writing abilities, she received a, a student nominated distinguished teaching award in 2019. Since 2017, she's focused on teaching and research in science communication. That's how we share specialized scientific information with non scientists. She has a PhD in information studies from the University of Toronto and an MA in communication studies from Concordia here in Montreal. Uh, Diane's uh, new to the Faculty of Science, but she brings a, a, a really, really important perspective and, and, and experience in the training of students in writing. Second up is Marcy Slapkoff. So Marcy's the Director of the Office for Science Education. Uh, she started at, uh, at McGill in 2006 with the Teaching and Learning Services as an educational developer, and she still is associated with TLS. Um, so it's a, a very important partnerships that, partnership that, that the Faculty of Science has with TLS. And she's worked with projects with instructors across the universities, across the university. Um, one of Marcy's major preoccupations is how to capitalize on McGill's research culture. So she's worked with designing projects that link research and teaching, it can be in the classroom or extracurricular activities. Um, and she's headed uh, several really interesting initiatives. One is the large class teaching exchange among professors, a really innovative program that she launched in the middle of this pandemic called SciLearn. It's an online program to help first year students transition to university by talking to them about learning strategies that are based on neuroscience. And she also headed uh, for the last two years, a really innovative uh, reset of our undergraduate poster session. So Marcy has a, an MA, a BA rather from, from McGill in English literature and an MA from Concordia in educational technology. So that's the scene setter. Um, uh, so let's, uh, let's uh, sit back, uh, get your cup of coffee or whatever you're drinking, whatever the hour is. Uh, uh, let's, let's, let's get things rolling. So maybe I'll just start, warm things up with a, a question or two uh, and let the conversation develop as it, as it may. Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Diane. Um, uh, because of, of your experience in the Writing Center and now what you're applying uh, in the Faculty of Science, Maybe I have a, a sort of an overarching question. Uh, what, why is science writing actually different from other forms of writing in English? Um, is it because the writing is done by scientists or, and I guess we can say that uh, they were kind of agreed apart, but, or is it something to do with the subject, subjects themselves? Hi everyone. Yeah, thanks for um, thanks for that question, Bruce. To get things started, um, this is a great question because I feel like it's one that students have asked me over the years when they um, begin uh, begin their programs, begin their degrees, or when they first get feedback on a on a writing assignment. They'll often say like. I thought I was a good writer. Like, why isn't this, um, you know, why isn't this showing, or why is this so much harder now that I'm in university? And um, you know, the the truth of the matter is, is that students are learning to write in a different way. You know, everyone can be kind of, well, not everyone, but lots of people are great writers coming out of high school and have good generalized knowledge of how to write at that level. But then they begin becoming like discipline apprentices. They need to learn how to communicate in their discipline. And it's interesting how you've grouped it together as science because it does seem like every department within the faculty of science has their own sort of particular ways of communicating specific journals. Um, and so there's really a lot for students to, you know, to pick up and to learn and sort of integrate and embody as they move through their degree and then they do it again as graduate students. 
um, in terms of like the way people communicate about science, it's not necessarily um, the problem of the scientists as authors, I wouldn't say, but there is a lot of specific terminology that's used in science. So a lot of times it's challenging for students to, you know, to learn all these terms that to an outsider might seem like jargon. And that's how students feel as they begin is that they're kind of an outsider who needs to figure out all these new words. Um, and then I do think some of the ways like that we learn science might challenge how we learn to communicate about it. So um, there are challenges like uh, if we're taught in a way that's assessed with multiple choice exams, then we're going to learn more kind of rote memorization so that we can kind of use the same words exactly and sort of parrot things back. But when students have opportunities to learn, like to comprehend more deeply and sort of add those kind of language specifics later, then they might have sort of like a kind of a deeper knowledge that they're able to, you know, transfer and use in different ways and sort of embody more wholly. So the sort of tradition of learning science might lend itself to some of the challenges with, with writing in science. Oh, I think you're muted, Bruce. So Marcy, uh, you know, over to you, but I, you know, I have follow-up question, of course. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone, or good day, or good evening, wherever you are. Um, I wanted to follow up on Diane's comment about students as outsiders moving into the discipline of science. And um, I think you may have noticed when Bruce was giving our um, bios that neither Diane or I have a background, an educational background in science. So in a way, we are both kinds of outsiders who have moved into, into the discipline of science. And it's very interesting to kind of replicate in some ways the journey that students take. And, one thing for me that comes to mind is that when we typically think of a scientist, an image that often comes to mind is, you know, someone in a lab coat, holding a test tube, doing an experiment. And yet with like a little bit more thought, other images may, you know, readily come to mind. Like you might imagine somebody in the field doing observations, like many of our profs and students do, writing in a field journal. Or you might think of somebody on TV or in the news as working with government, um, as we've seen a lot <laughs> in the last year and a half, uh, making uh, sharing science with the general public. Um, we have scientists at McGill who have contributed to the IPC IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel um, on Climate. We have scientists who have worked for Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, you know, international NGOs. So science scientists do a lot of communicating in a lot of different ways. And, so communications is really central to this work. And we often don't let students into that reality. We sort of, we kind of share with them the parts of science that are about doing experiments, methodology, mastering content, but they don't, maybe, maybe they don't get enough opportunities to do that kind of um, public speaking or dissemination of their ideas or writing to different audiences that would really serve them well and help them really, really understand what the scientific method is all about and all its different angles. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Marcy, you mentioned something that um, uh, really struck a chord with me. Um, in this past 18 months, months of, of uh, observing and participating in a global mess, I've certainly been struck at the incredible communication skills of our public health directors nationally and across the country. We see them on the news province by province. We see some from um, you know, other countries, but my goodness, they have incredible communication skills. Um, do we have, 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 I wonder if you've observed that or, and, and is it the nature of the problem that they're describing uh, or, or do they just come from a different gene pool that just, uh, or have they gone to to your your training programs uh, in in secret? Have Have you observed this too? It's I have, and to be honest, I think if we had sort of like wound back the clock twenty years on a lot of those speakers, I would suspect that they weren't as erudite as we see them today. And one of the reasons is because, especially in the last eighteen months, they have had a lot of practice. 
Um, they have had a lot of practice and a lot of feedback. Um, so this is one of the things that we at O's we work on with faculty members and with students. We really, students really need opportunities to practice in a very low stakes environment where they're not getting tested. They need to get friendly, helpful feedback and appreciative feedback. So they need to know what they're doing well and they need to be able to build on that. And that's really an important part of our education. So I can see 20 years down the road, our students really shining. Some of them already do. I think many of you were at the undergraduate poster showcase in the last couple of years where students have the opportunity to present their work, whether it was research work or even some did extracurricular activities, a volunteer work, course assignments. They presented their work, but they did have some coaching and practice beforehand with our alumni. And I think that really allowed them to up their game and communicate their ideas in a more succinct and clear way that was really appropriate for a non-specialist audience. Thank you. Um, you know, something had, that has struck me um, being in Montreal for the last 35 years is just the, the, the ever-presence multilingual feel, the multilingual reality. But multilingualism doesn't always mean fluency. Um, uh, I've, I've often been struck with my own experience that um, although I can often express an idea, uh, especially to students in a class when they have a, you know, a collective dumbfounded look as to what I'm describing in organic chemistry, uh, I can pivot uh, and, and find another way of expressing that. I can't do that in a second language, unfortunately. I have only whatever second language skills I have, which are modest. Uh, I can only express an idea in one way. How do you see that, that I'll call it fluency of maybe five ways of expressing an idea. Can this, can this be built into, into training, into skills development? Um, Diane, um, in, is it, and is it different between writing and verbal expression or is it all the same, same thing? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, and as you mentioned, we've seen some great examples uh, through the pandemic of the kind of the top doctors and medical advisors, some folks even from, from McGill that are doing an amazing job of communicating about these, these things. And, um, you know, this is the aim of some of the, the science communication courses that I developed at McGill, and there's a new one that I'm developing um, for hopefully for the winter with Alison Gonzalez. And a big goal there is to have students um, have the opportunities to, to do that kind of pivoting, to transfer, um, share the science that they have specialized knowledge of um, to other kinds of audiences. And I do think that having opportunities to do that, and these happen in other classes too. I know in some of the more kind of content focused classes, we see, you know, instructors including, you know, a policy assignment or an assi a podcasting assignment. And um, I think the more opportunities students have to use their own words or to really connect with an audience and think about what that audience needs, what kind of um, knowledge can, can we build on to for our, our uh, new explanations. I think that that creates that kind of fluency. So just having more opportunities. And in terms of sort of writing and speaking, there is um, there are studies around uh, self-explanation. So when students have opportunities to either write or speak out loud, sort of their thinking and their understandings of the scientific concepts that they're learning, that they are going to have a more sort of integrated comprehension and an ability to transfer that language. So rather than that sort of like remote, sort of like I can say the answer or back for this multiple choice question when they can sort of spend time using their own words and um, working out um, what exactly is happening within, you know, some kind of scientific situation, then they're more, more able to do that kind of transfer and more successful at it. So I think it's something to think about how we can, you know, create opportunities like that in classrooms. So Marcy, in terms of your experience in course development, how, how does one so Diane said that she's developing a, a course with, with Allison, and I'm very excited about that course. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a game changer in terms of the university. It's going to start, it has to start small. But how do you see, and as you, with your expertise in course development of embedding those concepts within pre-existing courses, um, do, do you, is there a path to do that? Is there a, is there a, is there a hunger or an interest? 
uh, in that in 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 the faculty among students and and our professors? Yeah, absolutely. I think there is. I think there is a hunger amongst professors for to search for ways to do meaningful assessment and for for students as well. There's lots of examples of profs who integrate some of these communication skills into the very like the foundation of their course, even if they're not experts in communication in, in communication science. So for example, it can be something very, very small sometimes, like building on what Diane said, sometimes just verbalizing um, an idea really helps to sharpen students' thinking. So when I work with instructors, we talk a lot about um, sort of low stakes and high stakes assignments. So low stakes would be something that's not graded and gives, just gives students a chance to practice an idea. And a great, great activity that instructors can do, and some are doing this, is just to ask students after they've done a reading, what is this about? So it's it seems crazy because it's so simple, and yet it really helps students to actually think like, what is the message of this article? This is a research article, let's say written by a premier scientist in their field. I'm still a novice, so it's it might be hard. It might be a struggle to actually read something complex and get the actual meaning from it. So giving students a chance to slow down and just try and understand um, uh, an article or any reading is such a key part of their education. And it's also great feedback for other students. If other students can hear this, um, so other students can hear another take on a similar piece of writing. Uh, they get to practice their speaking. They get to practice their writing if they've written it down. And then more than that, it's fantastic feedback for the instructor because the instructor may think the students have gotten the article because they've assigned it as homework. Um, but if the instructor slows down and asks the student to uh, reflect on what they've read and write about it or speak about it, they know whether that message is actually getting through. So that's just a, like a very simple example. And then there's you know crazy, sophisticated, more sophisticated, complex examples of profs doing, um, having students really refine their critical thinking skills by, uh, by doing all kinds of written and verbal assignments, like writing Wikipedia entries, writing blog posts or podcasts, as Diane mentioned, um, writing news and views articles, which are sort of like something you might find in nature, uh, in the nature journal, where it's sort of like a, not a complete um, rewrite of a research article, but something for a scientist, but non-specialist audience. So there's, there's many, many examples of professors doing all kinds of interesting, exciting, and very meaningful communications assignments with their students. It's funny that you, you, know, you used a term that, that harkens back to uh, elementary school, uh, maybe my own kids, but probably my own, of reading comprehension. And we don't actually use that term very often at the university level, at least in science. We, we don't often ask, did you understand, you know, to a student, did you understand what you read? Uh, but it is as about as fundamental as it gets. Um, uh, I guess when we had such a reliance on textbooks as being the, the foundation of, of so many courses, uh, certainly at the introductory level, um, it was kind of implied that, that it was a, uh, if there, if, if a student didn't have that, those reading comprehension skills, they, they simply couldn't grasp the course. But courses are not often being delivered in the form of a thousand page textbook anymore. They're sources from everywhere. I wonder, Diane, if it, when with your writing course uh, experience, uh, years of experience, how often do you, how often does the reading skill come into the pick, like uh, in, in a, in a uh, say a deliberate fashion? Uh, is, is it something that students are aware that their reading skills are the limiting factor in their uh, ability to express themselves? Or is it something that has to be pointed out to them? Yeah, that's a really great question, Bruce. The um... 
Yeah, the reading for writing is kind of a specific thing. I guess there's like a couple of things I would just say that, you know, come up or that I that I suggest with students. So one, um, one thing, I think sometimes students don't necessarily think like, I don't get it as much as like, maybe this isn't written for me, or, you know, I'll just kind of keep reading it in the same ways, and then I'll kind of get it. Um, but something that that I've done that I've found and actually I experienced that was quite powerful was um, when I was a PhD student, actually, I had someone, a, a professor I was taking a workshop with, actually stop and look up a word like in front of this group of graduate students. And it was so refreshing and it made me realize that I'd probably put pressure on myself like I should know every word in English, you know, or every word that I'm reading. And of course I don't. Um, but to have somebody actually be like, you know, what exactly does this mean? Is this the right, you know, is this a great word to use in this context? And to sort of go in and look it up, I think is powerful for students to, to continue learning. And so um, I think the message of like, we're all always learning in this institution and hopefully in this life, uh, I think is a really powerful one that is not just like students aren't great at this, but like, let's do steps to kind of keep adding to our knowledge, I think is, is really great. And then in terms of reading with writing courses, we kind of teach students to read differently, I guess. We teach students to look at like how a text moves. So, uh, you know, in some of my slides, I have like a pair of like sort of goofy like x-ray glasses. So it's kind of like put these on and read not just for content. So we hope you've read it once and understood, but let's, let, next let's look at how the pieces go together, what the author has done. So much of um, learning to write well is sort of understanding the pieces, the structure um, that is common, is expected by certain audiences, like for a journal, for a research paper, like what are the pieces that need to be there? And then how do you go about um, creating those with the content that you are writing about? So I think there's sort of different levels of reading that are really valuable. And that that's where, you know, like some of the assignments Marcy mentioned, like in News and Views has a very different shape than, you know, a kind of a manuscript does. So it's really great for students to have a chance to sort of go in and see the pieces and how things are constructed, as well as making sure they're familiar with the words, too. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, oh, sorry. Yes, yes. Go ahead, yeah. Marcy. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to build on what Diane is saying, because I really love talking about um, processes like the one Diane's describing, like, you know, a, a professor stopping midway through a course to look up a word. I feel this is so, so important that students really understand that learning is this constant process. And though profs may be experts in their field, that doesn't mean that they're still not learning all the time. And I think this sort of opens up possibilities for students when this is revealed. Um, students are often asked to, when, they're, when they are asked to do writing, they, they're, they're often asked to report on things that are already known or sometimes they're asked to investigate questions, but they give it in and then they get it graded. And they never see the multiple drafts that a, that a research scientist might go through until they actually get something published. Um, and it's, I, I know one prof um, who shares his, uh, his research papers that have been rejected in peer review with students and asks everyone like, can you help me? Like, can you help me uh, fix this so that it can go through peer review? I feel like it's a very humbling experience, but it's also, it's very generous to students. Um, and another assignment that I've seen some profs do um, in our faculty, they ask students a question in class, giving them a chance to digest some of the material. But then they also, instead of just projecting their slides, they project themselves writing. Um, so that students can actually see, well, they're going back and forth, they're scribbling things out, they're using like vernacular, like they don't, they're not, you know, they're not perfect. So I feel like it's okay for profs to show students that they're not perfect and it might help students also take some risks and develop their own, their own thinking and communication skills. Wow, uh, that's, that's so interesting because, <clears throat> you know, one of the, <clears throat> one of the features, um, and, you know, we're joined by you know many alumni today, and uh, and and uh, I see also some staff and faculty. But you know one of the things that really differentiates McGill um, continues to be the incredible quality of our students, the incredible plain smartness of our students. That doesn't mean that they have all these skills. So that's that's you know our 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 job to foster that. So um, you know sharing 
sharing our our, our uh, imperfections, uh, it's a funny word, but sharing our realities, um, I think is, is so appropriate. I hadn't heard of, of, uh, of my colleagues doing that, but I think it absolutely would capture the attention of students um, because you know, we, we're all in the same boat. Doing research is learning every day. It's, it's not research if you know what's going to happen, right? It's, uh, it's, it's in a textbook, it's not research. So, um, let me just go off on a bit of a tangent um, because we were just chatting. Um, something that when, when you were talking about, about reading and, and the, the different processes that can be uh, involved. Now, I, I, Diane, uh, in particular, when you were describing it, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself again, but you know, when I was uh, a young learner uh, in Ottawa, uh, there was an incredible push and it turned out to be, I found incredibly effective to learn the skills of speed reading. There were programs like literally with slide projectors of, and techniques of, you know, actually, you know, tracking, tracking text on, on, a, on a page in which, you know, the diagonal, I, I still use those techniques every day. Um, I never hear the term anymore. Is, is it, um, I mean, the mass of information, it, it seems to be even ever more important. And the key to speed reading was that when tested, comprehension always went up almost exponentially with, with speed until it would plateau. Um, does anyone, are those techniques used anymore, Diane? And, in a, in a formal teaching way? Yeah, good question. I haven't taught any speed reading skills. I definitely um, know that, <laughs> that there, this, is the, this is the updated version, but I know students are listening to our lectures at higher speeds. <laughs> so there's mm -hmm. definitely speed mm -hmm. listening. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are, you know, there are studies around how we read online, like the kind of digital reading and that people, you know, there's sort of key places within text that the eyes go to. And there's sort of like, you know, sort of like left to right and the, the, the sort of um, left column are the kind of places that catch our eye and like less so over here. So a lot of people, when they know something will be published online, sort of put key information there. And I'm also a big advocate. Anyone who's taken a class with me or even a workshop probably has heard me talk about the importance of, um, you know, what you do at the end of a paragraph or the end of a sentence is a, is a powerful place to put information. So there's that sort of thing. But I think that, you know, I too, I was like in elementary school or junior high and I ordered books on speed reading. And it was something that was like very interesting to me. And I was excited about um, learning this technique and, and do employ a bit of it today. Um, but it's not something that I know of, um, you know, being taught in most of our classes today. So maybe Marcy, you have more insights around, around that or other folks might too in the audience. Yeah, I can't say I know much about speed reading, but I do know about note taking. And there are several um, methods out there for note taking. And our students are curious about that as well, especially our first year students that really emerged in our, we had a SciLearn bootcamp, the program that Bruce mentioned earlier, um, where students are learning about how their brain works and how they might improve that might relate to their learning at university level. And when we gave them an option of a bunch of different topics, they all like converged on the note taking. And I think they realized that right away, the volume of content that they're getting in first year is very different from what they experienced in Stasia for high school. And so they're curious about note taking um, and about any sort of theories that exist on how to improve that. Um, one of you, uh, lost, lost track a bit, um, mentioned the word, used the word listening. And I know that Marcy, you've spoken to me about about listening skills. So, you know, I, I introduced the uh, old fashioned term of speed reading, but I, I'm actually not, I'm not familiar with what listening skills are and how that, can you, what, what role does that play in, in what you're designing and teaching? And, and well, maybe, maybe just tell me, or maybe everyone else knows what it means, but I'm not really sure what it means. Um, I think it's, funny kind of because we always think of communication skills as 
talking or writing, like putting stuff out there, but there's so much, I mean, communication is really about an interaction. It's a social interaction between people. And so what about, there's like one person talking, but what about the other person? What are they getting? And so, um, and the best kind of communication is where there's something generative happening between the person who's providing the information and the person who's receiving the information. And then they, there's actually some generation of ideas or um, dialogue that happens that can be written or verbal. Um, but in both cases, I think listening is the part of the equation that sometimes we forget. So when I'm working with professors, I often ask them, well, okay, your students are doing oral presentations, that's great. What do you expect of the students who are listening? What's their role? If you want them to be active, what can they do? And sometimes it's as simple as writing down what they've understood to go back to an earlier point. Sometimes it could be giving a, a, a presenter some feedback. Sometimes it could be going into groups after a presentation and discussing what they got out of it. There's many, many options for ways to students really improve their listening skills and become a partner in that communication process rather than just a passive recipient where it's, you know, things might just kind of get glossed over. I don't know, Diane, you have yeah. add there. Yeah, I'll jump in a little bit too, but I agree this listening component is is so key. We often focused on the output and without showing sort of like the labor that went into it. And, you know, and sometimes people are rewarded for the, you know, the speaking or the output as opposed to like what's gone in. And so there's a couple things related to listening. One is that um, I know with, uh, with teams, like when students are working in groups, uh, it's often important to emphasize that sometimes, you know, some of the best ideas come from the quietest students, like to make sure there's room for everyone to like hear each other. There's that great book by Susan Cain called called quiet and it's about being an introvert in a noisy world. Um, and then I also think uh, I, I dropped it in the chat a little bit earlier, but there's um, about kind of how we talk about science. There's this video that Alison Gonzalez had shared with me from the, a fellow named Brian Brown talking about like science context. And Alison has added a note there about how great it is to have sort of informal opportunities to talk about science. And a big part there is for students to hear each other speak in their own words, right? For it to be sort of like, this is how we speak with each other. Let's talk about science in this way. So I think a big part of learning isn't just the like I'm practicing saying it, but also like I'm hearing my peers speak about it and they're speaking in, in a way that I like to hear, I'm used to hearing and I can bring things in. And I'll just add one last note about this listening. And that is the sort of listening to yourself in your learning process and in your writing processes. Um, often in peer feedback or when we know there's going to be peer feedback, I'll ask students to um, think about what they would most like feedback on. And what I've found that helps with is having students sort of listen to the voice in their head as they're writing about things that are challenging. So sort of like, where am I having trouble? Where am I unsure? What do I want somebody to give me feedback on? And sort of concretizing the value of listening to those, you know, those little buzzes, those little uncertainties. I also tell them that like, if it's a question mark for them when they're writing, I'm certainly going to put a question mark around it when I'm marking. So there's this like, if it was a question for you, it's a question. So, you know, listen to that. And I think that that's really helpful instead of like, oh, I'll just try to like slide it under the rug. Maybe nobody will notice that I didn't totally get that. But, you know, there's such a value in sort of hearing ourselves and where we have challenges, where we need to back up and slow down and do something again. But, you know, that, that and, and that um, touches upon, you know, my, my, my personal observation that I referred to of the, the incredible skills of these directors and uh, of, of public health across the country. They're, they're speaking with confidence. I mean, it's an earned, a developed confidence, but that confidence is so important because they're, they're, they're relaying uh, uh, insight and sometimes actions on, on things that affect every person. But what you're describing, Diane, is, is, is so interesting because the confidence has to be developed like it's not just having it, but it has to be expressed. And uh, I think that's uh, that, 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 that will probably be quite different. The spectrum that, that students or any, any individual brings to that uh, is, is probably quite, quite broad, quite 
person specific. But the, the goal is to bring everyone up to a level where they're expressing the, their confidence in their knowledge. So it's a really, uh, really interesting, really interesting uh, approach that you're describing. We have, we have uh, lots, lots more to talk about, but I just wanted to take a pause because we have a really, really uh, interesting question from uh, Marilyn Scott. Hi, well, Marilyn, it's great to see you this morning. Um, so Marilyn's professor at, uh, in the Faculty of uh, Agriculture and Environmental Sciences at, 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 many of you know, just as Mac. And uh, you, you could take, the, take the, uh, the microphone, Marilyn, if you just wanted to elaborate on your question. It's really, really important question, I think, that you put in the chat. Or I can read, read it if you like, but go ahead. Well, thanks very much. Uh, it's a fascinating conversation, um, which I'm really enjoying. But this point that I raised is I, I, I find I'm so frustrated that it takes so many drafts for graduate students to pull together a manuscript these days. And, and I never remember that as a problem. When I was writing, I like you, Bruce, I mean, this is many, many, many years ago, but we didn't have computers. And if you were writing something, you wrote it by hand and you gave it to your supervisor and you might've got some feedback and you might have revised it, and then it type, got it typed up and sent it into a journal. So I, I've always wondered whether that slower thought process that's necess necessitated by writing by hand actually helps people to really think carefully, more carefully about how they're structuring their ideas than is possible when you type on a computer and the words just fly out as they, without perhaps without that, without that critical thinking. And that if that might in some ways be delaying the ability or interfering with the ability to really develop and, and think through what your logic is behind an idea. So I'm curious to see what uh, others might think, Diane and Marcy might think about that. Yeah, I can I can say a little bit about this. Um, I meant I was mentioned my PhD is in information studies, so this is a topic that sometimes people uh, work through in information studies. And there definitely has been um, there's been work on sort of retention when people are working reading on screen, they're less likely to retain than if they're reading on paper. And I know uh, my age kind of puts me, you know, in this category to where I did start with handwriting before computers, and um, certainly when I need to do like my most kind of of like thinking work, I always go back to paper. I know I have peers, uh, colleagues from the writing center who kind of insist on the, the written notebook, even if it means they're kind of lugging around more paper. I'm sure they're not doing that in the pandemic, but previously. Um, so, you know, there's this sort of like going back to the paper does seem like it, um, you know, it can be really beneficial. And there's something about um, finding your way through a document too, like just the scroll versus like, you know, it's in, on page eight that I hand wrote. You sort of like know how far along you are within a document. Um, I will say that there's there you know there are some differences probably between those of us who were like learned on paper versus um, younger folks who have been you know most of their lives using you know using iPhones using iPads using computer to do their writing. They might have developed these things a bit differently. Um, I think there is more research in this area, but um, but I'm not sure. I know there's there's a, a book that came out a couple of years ago called Reader Come Home that was really about like reading books paper you know published um, tangible books. So so there's definitely thinking that is in line with what you're saying that you know it is important to be able to 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 work through things by hand. Um, so yeah, there there could be something to what you're saying. Although I do see students doing very well without ever touching pen and paper too. So very very interesting. I I, I think that uh, Marilyn's um, side comment or sort of embedded in that is just of the. The, the 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 relationship of the, the the pace the pace of thinking perhaps matching the pace of of writing um, and uh, of of manual writing and uh, I think it's a uh, uh, really really interesting certainly something to study uh, not that we don't have enough to study but um, I I do feel that um, just while working with Marcy and 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 Diane specifically that um, of how um, how little I know about the, the scholarship about learning, you know, after being a, a teacher for thirty five years and uh, being a student for the the, the twenty something years before that, um, I, I really 
I, I really hope that that the the uh, the, uh, the scholarship of learning can break out uh, into the public space the way the, that that science has has broken out in the last ten years. I, I think it'll be really exciting for for people to 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 learn how they've learned and and how that's been analyzed because it's otherwise it's kind of a I'd say pretty much a mystery uh, to most most people and most students. Uh, Marcy, I look like I interrupted you. Uh, no, no, I'm just like I my face always displays when I'm thinking. It's not always when I'm talking. <laughs> so okay. Okay. um yeah, really interesting, Marilyn. So nice to have you here today. And what a good question. Um I I think that one of the issues is that students are not getting a pra enough practice at the undergraduate level with their writing. And I think that might contribute to this drafting and like, like voluminous drafts. Um, I think, you know, when students get the opportunity to really write with a purpose and for a specific audience at the undergraduate level, they come to understand that when they get to the graduate level, there's a certain, um, there are certain conventions that must be adhered to. So I think when those become very explicit at the undergraduate level, students come to the graduate level better prepared to do their graduate writing. So I'm, I'm putting a lot of efforts these days um, on working at the undergraduate level to see how we can work with profs who are content matter experts to bring more writing into their classes and have students experiment with different types of writing and different audiences. So we're really getting them ready for the grad for graduate school. Really interesting. So I'm looking at the clock um, and looking at the chat. I'm not, I don't see other questions in the chat. If so, someone would like to pop pop one in, uh, this is your your uh, last call. Um, uh, I have one, one sort of overarching question uh, to make sure that we get to, because um, we'll have to close down sometime uh, just before uh, just before the hour, um, and we have a very important uh, uh, you know statement that I, I I missed at the very beginning to uh, to to finish our our our, our homecoming uh, uh, discussion about. So maybe maybe I'll very unfairly kind of ask a um, pretty a big question. Um, we've um, we, we've uh, we're emerging, but we're not. We haven't emerged, but we're emerging from a really difficult situation in the past eighteen months at all levels, personal, professional. As you know, teachers, we haven't until this September we didn't see any of our students, um, and those in the big classes are still in, in remote learning. Um, but from the perspectives that each of you have. Uh, uh, because you're, you 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 are very engaged with students in the, the nature of 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 your uh, your positions. Um, where what what did, what what makes you feel optimistic about you know the next uh, ten years or so? Like the interactions you've had with our professors, our instructors, but especially our students. What's um, what 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 do you see in in uh, the, the coming years? That, that brings hope to to what you're what you're doing. Um, I can jump in first. So something that makes me hopeful, and and Bruce, this kind of works with what you just did and just said, was that. Um, I think it's becoming more common and more comfortable for people in instructor roles, for professors to say that there's more for them to learn, you know, like in, in classrooms to say like, I'm learning too, and I want to learn like with my students, from my students. And I think that really, you know, opens opens things up in the classroom, in the institution for people to try new things, to get feedback from students. Students love to feel like they're being listened to. And I think it was really critical that we did a lot of listening to students during the pandemic during these remote times that we were kind of asking, you know, how they were, what they needed, this sort of thing. And um, I think this also to kind of to, uh, leap to another slightly, you know, slightly different topic. I think this also opens things up in terms of talking about belonging in classrooms, about equity and diversity and inclusion. It lets us hear from students what, what 
we can change. And, you know, as um, professors too, we're more able to think through, you know, what works for us and what kinds of, you know, what kinds of accommodations and approaches we can include. So that sort of openness to these conversations really makes me hopeful. And I think, you know, as, as terrible as the pandemic has been, I think it's been, you know, a real motivator in that direction. Really, really interesting because, um, uh, you know, the concept of inclusion would one wouldn't have thought that this would have this situation would have facilitated it, but um, you know what you're describing that perhaps it's it's just um, taken us through a bypass um, into into the inclusion space because um, it it clearly doesn't have to be a, a, doesn't have to have the physical representation to to actually have meaningful inclusion really really interesting marcy um any perspective personal or professional on on this if yeah where we're where we're going i think um i don't want to sound too idealistic but i think students who have great communication skills and faculty as a community that we do have the power to change the world I think people who can listen to each other across barriers, like whether they're disciplinary barriers, cultural, linguistic, economic, I think people who can listen to each other across those divides and speak to each other and write to each other, whether they're you know, writing research papers or tweets or in the on blogs or wherever, I think together we need those skills if we're going to actually improve the situation, the, the global situation. So, you know, to respond to the, the comment in the chat about the climate crisis, I think this is an area where we really need, we need, we need science, but the science is there. So we need communication that we can actually engage in together to lead to effective behavior changes and attitudinal shifts. So, when I look at communication skills, I really see it at the core of what the university is. And it's, it's you know, inextricably linked to science and to helping students really refine their thinking skills and putting those into action to make things better. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marcy and Diane. And, you know, both of you, um, Diane, with your, your um, highlighting inclusion, and Marcy, you're you're uh, really highlighting the the nature of debate. You know, it. Um, I recommend to everyone on this on this this call uh, a document that was produced about three years ago. It was a task force on respect and inclusion. It was a principles task force. Um, I was the co lead on it with a colleague in the faculty of law, but you know we were we were leading the discussion. But a great deal of that was about the importance of of debate and, uh, and the, the, the knowledge of how to exchange ideas, which is so intrinsic to inclusion um, uh, and, and about listening. Uh, and many of the things that we're, we're talking about, not, but they were never presented within uh, sort of the development of a, of a type of student, a, a science student versus anything else. It was about the university community. So, um, that's, I think, um, if, if, uh, I don't know, Jennifer, maybe if you can find that uh, quickly or, or we can just recommend it, but I think there's a lot, um, just as you're speaking, I'm, 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 I'm hearing that 40 page report, um, being kind of verbalized of, of the, the priorities. Um, I guess my, 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 my other observation to what you were saying, Marcy, is, um, those out who are hiring our students, uh, the, the people who are who our students are eventually working with, there's no question that the communication skills are like just an essential, essential part of of being hired, uh, being successful in positions of all types. Yeah. A small fraction of our B, BSc students end up working in a, in a lab environment uh, five years after they've graduated. They often start there, but you know, then they become managers, they become directors, they become marketing people and companies, et cetera. So all of those, um, 
all of those things end up um, reinforcing that this, this becomes an essential skill and not, not just a, a soft skill. Um, so um, I've enjoyed, I, I hope you've enjoyed this morning. I certainly have. I think it's, uh, um, I really appreciate the comments in the chat that of, of how people have found it, but uh, you can communicate with Jennifer about uh, things that, you know, other things that you'd like to hear about. Um, this has, this whole um, discussion has, has um, actually stimulated my, my idea that Jennifer is going to, uh, develop for next year is, and I think that what we should talk about is the other form of communication in science that is essential, um, that we think is being too disciplinary, and that's data and mathematics. So next year, I think what we'll talk about, Jennifer, is we'll have almost the same discussion with Dave Stevens and a couple of colleagues about the role of understanding among all of our students and expressing it um, uh, science in the form of mathematics and vice versa. And I think that uh, will complement our discussions today. Um, as we wrap up, um, I want to thank you all. I, I recognize many of you, but not all of you. Um, it, it's great to have you join us uh, today. And I want to just uh, end uh, this homecoming uh, session with actually something that we usually begin a session with, but it was my, my oversight. Um, and I'd like to uh, maybe ask Diane if she could actually um, express um, the land acknowledgement that's uh, so important to us here at McGill. Thanks for the opportunity. So McGill University is on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous people, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. Sorry about that. Uh, today, on the day that follows the inaugural National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, I'd like to connect the past with the present. You likely already know that as part of the Truth and Reconciliation Report, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people of Turtle Island have worked to distill 94 concrete calls to action. Let's re-familiarize ourselves with these calls and, as we can, within our own areas of expertise and influence, continue to the long continue the long-term or contribute to the long-term process of reconciliation. Each step we take matters. Thank you for that, Diane. And indeed, uh, each step is very important and it's inevitable that each step will involve many of the things that we've been talking about today of, of listening and uh, communicating and, uh, and arguing and, uh, and more listening. So thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jennifer, for organizing this. Uh, thank you for reminding me that it was my idea, but it's not my idea. It's, it's everyone's idea. We have this great team in the Office for Science Education. And, uh, 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 and as I said, uh, what we're able to do is because of, of alumni, uh, donors who have come forward to actually fund these positions. And we now have, uh, I think, as many as nine, nine Nine people, is that correct, Marcy? Working um, within the office? There's about um, uh, six staff members and um, 14 students yeah, who work yeah. part time. So this is um, from, from nothing uh, uh, four, four years ago, and it's, and it's now an essential part of, uh, to use that word again, of, of the Faculty of Science. So thank you all. Uh, really hope you had uh, uh, a or are having a great homecoming. Uh, there are more events throughout today, uh, but um, this is the Faculty of Science's only explicit part of, of the calendar. Um, they won't give us a whole week, will they, Jennifer? No, so very good. So thank you. Have a great day, wherever you are. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.